Okay, so we have at this conference, we have four panels, and the idea of these panels is that they're going to be conversations, not your usual, like, one person goes down the line and says something and then the next person does. So we're hoping this will be a little bit more interactive. Um, to kick off the meeting, our first panel is about the synthesis, um, about synthesis of research evidence, and I have here with me Pam Buckley, Jeff Valentine, and Emily Tanner-Smith, all people that I've worked with before, um, so I would consider friends. Um, they're all three involved in clearing houses, and I think that's really important for the conversation today. So both Emily and Jeff are part of the um, Institute for Education Sciences What Works Clearinghouse Statistics Website and Training Contract, and Pam is co-director for Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development, a clearinghouse focused on reducing violence, delinquency, and substance abuse. And so we had a conversation recently, and I'm going to kind of jump back into that conversation. So I want to start with the positive. When we had our conversation, we sort of talked about the growth that you've seen, examples of successes, how you feel like you've seen clearinghouses move along in this sort of evidence pipeline and in the synthesis world. And I was wondering if you could just start with sort of telling me what you think that growth has, has been. So let me, let me kick that off with a response. Um, just to take a quick step, step back, though, is I think it's helpful to draw on what Larry was describing in terms of what the role of the clearinghouse is. And I give an analogy when I describe the work that I do to people that aren't as familiar with this type of work. And I draw an analogy similar to here in the United States, we have what's called the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, part of the United States government, and its job is to evaluate the evidence of things we consume. For example, food. We don't want to consume food that isn't safe or that isn't um, healthy, et cetera. And so the role of the clearinghouse were similar in that there are so many studies out there about programs that say they work. And we want to know if we can trust the evidence. So the role that we play in a clearinghouse, similar to the FDA, is we examine, we basically audit these individual studies, and we look at the scientific evidence behind those individual studies, and we provide our methodological expertise to determine if we can trust those findings. And if those findings are sound, then we have an accessible website who the consumer that we're really trying to attract are teachers and policymakers and funders so that they can trust coming to our organization. And then they get information. There is some information about what are the methods behind those studies, but front and central is what is the theoretical rationale of that program? What is it designed to produce in terms of change? How, what do those activities look like? And something as simple as, who do I go to to get information on that intervention and what do the materials cost? So that's kind of, to, just to give you a sense of what we do up here. And just like we don't want to consume food that isn't healthy, we don't want to invest in programs that don't work, or worse, we don't want to invest in programs that do harm. So that's the role that we play. And Blueprints, where I work, um, was founded in, in 1996. So we were one of the first in the United States to be doing this kind of work. And the person that founded the organization, Dr. Del Elliott, is still on our board, as is Larry Hedges. And Del describes to me what the field looked like 30 years ago. And at that time, he said it was a really big deal to have one study conducted on a large sample um, in which subjects were randomly assigned to receive the treatment or not, and then we could look at results. So we could look at one study, and if it was conducted well, felt safe in terms of saying this is effective and putting it on our website. But fast forward 30 years, and the number of randomized control trials being conducted, and people are investing in this, these kinds of studies. They're expensive. They take a lot of time to conduct. The, the mere number has increased the methods for conducting these studies have been improved upon. We can't always do a randomized controlled trial for many reasons, so the methods around what we call a quasi-experimental design have improved. So we might have a researcher determining the conditions in which an individual is assigned to receive the treatment or not, but those methods have become more and more sophisticated. So we do see, over time, an improvement. That being said, we're still struggling with knowing what works. And what I mean by that, let me give an example. We have 30 years of studies in our database. We have over 10,000 studies we've looked at. We have over 1,500 individual programs. And of those 1,500, 87 have met our, what we consider to be our scientifically strong enough to say we trust those methods to say that those results are effective. 
And of those 87, only 17 have been replicated and shown sustained long-lasting effects to where we feel confident saying to a school district or to a state, if you implement this particular program, you can expect to achieve those outcomes. So while we have seen improvement over time, there's still a lot more work to be done in terms of figuring out what works. And I would also um, follow that up with a lot more work that needs to be done to communicate, which is what your organization is going to be working on. How do we get that important information into the hands of the people who need it the most, the people who are on the ground working with students, working in communities? And how does that compare to your experience at the What Works Clearinghouse, either Jeff or Emily? I think the What Works Clearinghouse is a little bit different, different in the sense that um, kind of the, the bar that the WWC is aiming for is, is just not, is not exactly the same bar that the Blueprints group is looking for. But clearly we see improvement over time. So if you look back, uh, a study from, done from 1995 to 1999 would be about half as likely as a study done from 2014 to 2018 to meet WWC standards. And that's a really good improvement. Um, and I, you know, I think that 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 bodes well for the future of the meta-analyses that the Clearinghouse does because it makes them bigger and more robust. And so I think that's a nice, a nice thing. That reminds me, one of the biggest critiques of meta-analysis has been that it's sort of apples and oranges being you know, thrown in, that you've got you know, a, a lot of studies, but maybe they're all poorly done, and so what does that, what does that make? But the, that's in contrast to these clearinghouses where you have very clear guidelines for how the quality of studies going in so that you can make sure that you have only high quality findings coming out. I'm just saying that mostly for the audience who might not be aware that that's um, sort of the role here. And Beth, if I could just add to that though, the, and I think we're going to talk about this more throughout the panel, but the challenge to that is when you've, get, you've got one study that's conducted well and it's showing effectiveness, and you've got another study conducted on the same, a similar population showing different results. So that's in terms of the decision making going, around, going into whether this is a program you can hang your hat on and say we trust the evidence. And that's something clearinghouses are struggling with and that we really need to think about how are we going to handle conflicting evidence going forward. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that that it seems like often when it's conflicting, it's not so much that it's exactly the same context, right? It's, so this kind of gets to my second question that I had about sort of the role of external validity. And maybe I'll have Jeff sort of start there a little bit on, on what you see going on with that. External validity is a really hard problem for um, clearinghouses. And I think anybody who does systematic reviews, the first, one of the first things they'll tell you is these study reports actually don't tell us as much as we would like to know about the context in which the study occurred. And, and that, that problem extends to things like what exactly was the intervention sometimes. And it makes it really, really hard to, to come up with statements. Um, so, you know, we've been working a lot on uh, trying to figure out how to get study authors to report those things better. Um, I do know that uh, I have one or two toes in the waters of clinical medical research. And the folks there are also very worried about external validity, about the generalizability of findings. So I think that um, most people believe that the typical sample in a randomized trial of a drug is less sick on average than the general population to whom the drug might be available. And I, I suspect that we see similar things in education as well. Yeah, and to touch on both of those issues about um, sort of the progress that we've made as a field over the past several decades and also thinking about these issues of external validity, I think something that's quite exciting to me as a meta-analyst and an education research researcher is really this emphasis on exploring heterogeneity and looking at variability in effects. And I think that that really resonates with this concept that when we're interested in studying education programs or policies or practices, we can't answer these, we can't just focus on these simple questions about does this work or not. We really have to dig deeper to understand 
who does it work for best, under what circumstances, and under what contexts? And I will say from my own experience, um, for instance, that uh, the statistical methods that uh, Larry Hedges and Beth Tipton have developed have really paved the way for researchers to explore these kinds of issues. Um, so I'll give you an example of a meta-analysis I conducted uh, with colleagues with funding from the Gates Foundation, where we were exploring um, variability in the effects of digital games and how those can improve student learning outcomes or not. Um, and so we were able to use some of these newly developed statistical techniques to really dive down into what are the mechanics of the digital games, what are the design features of those games that can maximize students' learning outcomes or not. Um, so I'm very excited about these increased um, development of these tools that can help these applied researchers ask these critical questions that are really um, just paramount for the field. That just, I mean, so just to follow up on your comment, so I, I, something I've been worried about a lot is, is sort of getting best, the best methods to researchers in the field. And so I have a paper recently where we sort of did a review of the literature and found that a lot of people are not using the best methods. And so I'm just wondering what your sort of thoughts about that are as researchers, putting your little bit of research hat on for a second, um, less on a translation, but if we, we need to be able to translate even the best methods to the researchers in order to get findings that can then translate to the rest of the world. Well, and this is where I think, you know, the tools that you propose for the STEP Center, I think that's a, definitely a first step in terms of getting those salons that um, students and budding scholars and senior experienced scholars can participate in those tutorials, those institutes and those workshops, and really trying to disseminate that and infuse that in our, our undergraduate as well as our graduate curricula in our colleges of education. I mean, my hope is that I make software and I, I don't know much about actually um, how to think about the user experience in the creation of that software. And I think that's true for most statisticians. So it's one of the reasons that I'm excited about doing this work in the, in the center. Um, I wanted to go back, Emily, in our conversation, you talked a little bit about legal barriers to sharing data and why this was a problem, legal and cultural barriers. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of make that clear to the audience what those problems are. Um, yeah, and so again, thinking about sort of vision, mission, where are we going in the field of evidence synthesis and education, I think an exciting advance from my perspective is the increasing synthesis of both aggregate study level data in combination with individual student level data and we often will call this individual participant data or IPD meta-analysis and so I think that IPD meta-analysis as a method or a tool is very useful to allow us to ask these questions about what kind of students is this program working best or not so good for um, and so in order to do these IPD meta-analyses, though, that does require access to those individual student-level data. Um, so I'm currently working on two NIH-funded projects to do this kind of IPD meta-analysis. And I will say that there are structural and institutional barriers um, that are quite limiting. So for instance, many individual um, Study authors may, for instance, have language in their um, human subjects research consent forms that prohibit sharing of data outside of anyone beyond their original research team. And so that's going to be a challenge for us as a field as we go towards this sort of open science, open data, transparency framework where we want to be sharing those data so that they can be compiled and synthesized in meaningful research syntheses. Um, there are also cultural barriers, too, in terms of uh, researchers not being willing to share data or being hesitant to share data, you know, concerns about scooping, um, and then also institutional barriers such as um, data sharing agreements between universities that have to be set up in order to do this data sharing. Um, so I think that those are larger issues that the field will have to deal with as we move towards uh, this sort of open science data sharing uh, framework, especially as we're thinking about how that can inform evidence synthesis. Have you guys encountered these problems in your work or? Yeah, I, I certainly have. Um, I have a, a colleague, Spiros Konstantopoulos, and I were trying to do um, uh, independent individual participant data meta-analysis on some teacher related data and we had 15 potential studies and we're told 15 times that we couldn't have access to the data because of agreements um, but you know you know I I sort of think that 
that um, it's, it's ethical to allow individual people to opt out of an of a, of a individual level sharing data like that. And so there's a sense in which I think that problem is not going to go away. And, and maybe what we ought to do is be thinking about ways that we can encourage reporting that would help us create simulations that would you know, give us 10 or 100 different versions of what the data could have looked like. Uh, so I'd like to see some work there. It's a great idea. I'm just thinking that fits with, uh, Larry has some work on data disclosure, and that seems like that fits right, right in with that. The other issues that people brought up that I thought were particularly interesting were about homegrown measures and about the difficulty of sort of, you know, so one of the things you're trying to do is make sense of all of these different studies and all of these different findings. And I believe, Emily, were you the person who said something about homegrown measures that um, everybody has different measures? Um, and so I was just wondering if you guys could elaborate. I'm, I'm assuming people in the audience don't necessarily know that much about this, era, this, this kind of work. Was it? You're, you're looking. I can actually. Can you? Oh, great. great. I'm not sure if I remember right. Um, so there's a couple ways to think about this. One way is it's important that the information you're collecting on the individual participants is completely agnostic to the intervention. And so that, you can think about that on multiple levels. One way to think about it is the person that is collecting what we call outcome data on, so what, is, what do the test scores look like at the end of the intervention, et cetera, the person collecting them should not be the person delivering the intervention, so you're independent of that intervention. That's one way to think about it. Um, another way to think about it is the measure that you're using to collect information on the individual participants needs to be standardized in some way and norm with the population that you're studying. And this is specific to education. So where I'm at Blueprints, we work across fields, education being one, and we see a lot in education this idea of what I hear about a proximal versus a distal measure. So proximal being, it is really hard. And for those of you doing this work, you know, it is hard to move the needle in terms of changing those state standardized test scores. And we all know for many reasons why. Um, so you see some of these measures being developed that researchers claim are more proximal to their intervention and they, even, and they might even have some validity on them. They've done some psychometric analyses, et cetera. Um, and so there's a big debate in the field. What happens when your program affects those proximal measures that could have been developed by the person who developed the intervention themselves or by someone within the field versus those state standardized test scores. And so we don't really have a good answer to that. There's a lot of debate and a lot of blogs talking about that. Um, and what does that say in terms of whether you believe this program is effective? It's affecting these proximal measures, but not these more distals. And these are the, some of the decisions, no matter there are so many standards out there, and here at Blueprints we claim to have high, or we do have rigorous standards, but these are some more nuanced decisions that as a board we talk about and think about and what is it that we think we can claim as showing true effect. And so when we were talking in the panel about what are some of the challenges we face in terms of doing this work with the clearinghouse, that's one that seems to be coming a lot up quite a bit and quite a bit in education. Is that true in the? Um, yes, and I would say to, to build on that, um, and again, sort of going back to this concept of synthesis, um, I think that the field of education has some progress that we can make here, especially if we perhaps think about um, uh, mechanisms that the NIH has used, for instance, to define some common data elements within certain subfields or common outcome constructs or common outcome measures um, that are critical for key outcome domains. And so I could see this, for instance, easily mapping on to um, director I, the director of IES's, Mark Schneider's, his um, proposed priorities for IES really clearly outlining uh, key outcomes. And so really that scenario we can make some improvement on in terms of thinking about common data elements. Um, and you definitely see a move towards that in several institutes with the NIH for this reason exactly. Um, I, I do a lot of social behavioral um, science as well as education science, and I did have uh, the privilege of working with the Office of Adolescent Health uh, previously doing a synthesis of teen pregnancy prevention programs, and I thought one of the very sort of innovative and forward-thinking moves of that office is that um, through their teen pregnancy prevention um, 
um, funding of over 40 trials of new teen pregnancy prevention studies that they actually mandated that their grantees measure a set of core outcomes that they were really interested in moving the needle on. Um, so things like, um, you know, abstinence, um, frequency of unprotected sex. And so they had defined these core outcome measures that all of the grantees were required to measure, but those grantees could also measure some additional outcomes, right? So it's not being entirely prescriptive, but saying we do care about this uh, sort of common data elements that we want to have available, and they actually did that because they knew that they would be synthesizing that evidence. So I think we need to be moving more in that direction. That's a great point. I think you're, yeah, okay. I think you're touching on a really important science policy question, and, and, and Pam's response gets at it too. Um, you know, the whole, I think the whole problem is that education is a complex system. And learning is complex. And so you have the, and children exist in families and neighborhoods and communities that are complex. So you have these interlocking complex systems. And the, the ability to affect any valued outcome is actually, I think, really pretty small for any given intervention. Um, and so this means that um, our trials need to be large enough to be able to have a reasonable chance of actually detecting so those small effects. Um, it also means those trials take a long time to do. And the, the science policy part of it comes into the fact that most people producing education research are doing so in an uh, environment that rewards quick publication. Right? And so, um, you know, a, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. I'd rather get this study published now on a proximal outcome than have the potential to get something published a year and a half from now on, on an outcome that people value. Um, and, and on top of that, my study has to be five or six or seven times bigger for this thing in a year and a half than, than for now. So I think it's a, that's a really complex problem that probably isn't going, going to go away anytime soon. Um, so. That's a, great, that's a great point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, it just occurred to me that the other place that this becomes problematic is with developer-funded studies, right? So if you have somebody who has a stake in it, I mean, you could say the academics also have a stake in it, um, but with developers, it seems even stronger that they might have an outcome that makes them look good. Um, and I'm wondering now that I'm thinking about this, how the WWC and Blueprints handles developer-funded studies or... Um, or if you've encountered that. Well, the clearinghouse is agnostic with regards to source, but Pam mentioned a really, a really great analogy is that the things we thing we're doing is sort of like the FDA, but we don't have the legal force that the FDA has either, so we don't see all the studies. And you can bet that the studies that these clearinghouses get constitute an unknown sample from a, a larger population of studies. Um, and it's not hard to imagine a cynical world in which developers are maybe incentivized to submit or to release certain studies and to withhold other studies. I think that's a very difficult problem. Yeah, so we do, um, in terms of how we identify studies to examine, we are agnostic, like you said. Um, we allow for individuals to submit um, studies for us to review, but we spent a quite a bit of time of human resources examining the literature. And by that, not just examining what's sent to us or what's peer reviewed and has been published, but also trying to get at those unpublished studies. And part of where, and we'll talk about this in some of the questions I think you're gonna lead to in a bit, the direction that we are going in is it just makes sense for whether it's you get the information from what works or blueprints, we are sitting on a gold mine of doing that analysis. Um, and if we do our job well, we are tapping into what we call the gray literature. And by that, we mean these have not been peer-reviewed publications, but they're ones that maybe um, was, you know, we, whether it was a school district that got funding to do a study and they put it on their website, we're trying to get at that information as well. And that gets into the difficulty of looking at what happens when you do have so many studies on the same topic. And some programs have more studies than others because some programs have been along, around longer, but um, how do you handle that, the different kind of information? Um, but one other thing I wanted to bring up that I thought you were gonna allude to, Jeff, was here at Blueprints, one of the things that we think about in terms of how do you get our highest rating? And by that we mean 
This is an intervention that is, has such strong scientific evidence. It's showing lasting events, uh, uh, sustained effects. It's been replicated. Another thing we look at is who conducted the study themselves. And is that person completely independent of developing the intervention, developing any kind of outcome measure? They have no financial gain in doing this kind of work. And we are looking for those kinds of studies. And that those, we, we haven't seen a lot of those where at least one study is completely independent of any involvement in doing this kind of work. And they are showing the sustained effects. But it is something that we consider in terms of thinking about how much can we trust that evidence. Can I get, um, so you know, I have to say I worry about that a little bit. Um, because it seems to me that, that uh, especially in the early life cycle of developing an intervention, it's really important right. to have the, the, uh, some contact with the mm -hmm. people who know how to make the thing work. And I, I guess what, in, in my ideal world, uh, there, you know, there would be a lot of developer involvement in the initial stages of the study, but there's some point where there's a red line and the developer you know, gets essentially cut out, so they don't do any of the analysis. Uh, as, as an example. And that's exactly, you just defined better what I was trying to define. Okay, Absolutely. Well, okay yep. great. Um, I thought we were going to disagree, but. Yeah, actually, we're, I, we're I said that they should try to fight about something <laughs> while they were up here. Uh, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit because I want to, I want to, so we've been talking a lot about synthesis as a means almost to just comment on the primary studies themselves. And I want to sort of shift for the last half of this to talk a little bit about the synthesis world it's, itself. Um, and so, Emily, you said something during our call that I thought was like, really important, and I want you to say more about it, which is you said, evidence as a term has become so overused that it's meaningless. And um, it's very provocative, so I'd like, <laughs> like you to say more. Yes. Um, so I do think, unfortunately, that the term evidence and the term evidence-based um, these are terms that have been co-opted uh, by program developers, by individuals with, who are pr producing programs or educational curricula on the market. Right? So they have a financial conflict of interest there. And then really that co-optation of that term is very problematic. I have seen many examples, I won't name names, um, of program developers selling their program or their curriculum as evidence-based. And then as you, as, you know, as a researcher, I can then go dig into that evidence and see, okay, well, what kind of evidence is this? Maybe it is professional opinion or, you know, content expertise. So thinking about Larry's comments about tradition and values and beliefs and prejudices. Um, but many times you go down and dig into that evidence and these are poor quality design studies that have very limited, if any, um, internal validity, let alone external validity. Um, and so that's very problematic, again, if we're thinking about translation, because if you're a teacher or a, a policymaker or a practitioner, you may not have the time or the energy or the, the background to be able to go down and dig down into that evidence to really evaluate whether it's credible or not. Um, and so I think that that's where the role of the clearinghouse does come in. I think that's the vision and the mission of these clearinghouses is that they can serve as trusted repositories of education so that we can be convinced, right, that this team of experts um, who knows about scientific evidence and research quality has done that due diligence to define whether this meets that high bar or not. And if, can I piggyback on yeah. that? Um, so actually on our website. We, we think about at Blueprints, and I would think Jeff would agree with the work he does at What Works, to think about evidence on a continuum. And by that we mean it makes sense for an idea to start based on an opinion. You have an idea, it's like what Larry was talking about, your professional insights. This seems like it might work. So you develop an idea and then you bring that information along a continuum. So you might develop an intervention, then you go out and you might test it. You might collect information on that program before, you know, maybe some data before individuals received it, some data after. You might be collecting some or developing some instruments to define your, your, your intervention so you can look at the fidelity of how well it's being implemented. You test it out, you revise. Then you bring it to another phase where you're thinking, okay, this seems to show promise. I've got kids that are showing that their achievement is improving over time. And I've got some instruments developed that describe my intervention. 
I now want to test it out against those who don't receive the intervention. And that's where you start to develop what's called a control group study. Might not be the fancy ones we're talking about. It could be that you just find one classroom and a teacher is willing to say, okay, I'm going to teach the way I usually teach. And then you find another classroom that says, I'm going to try out this intervention. And you collect data on it and you see that the, those who had that program, they're actually improving more, more, that, more than those that don't. So that all is considered evidence, and that is a continuum. What Emily and I think the folks of us up here are trying to get at is when we get to the level of talking about making causal inferences, we want to know if it really works. And that's where you get into these more sophisticated randomized control trial studies. You might get into what some fancy language around regression discontinuity designs, these more sophisticated quasi-experimental studies. We want to then get to that phase and then I always say we talk about the randomized control trial being the gold standard. I don't know how many of you out there who don't do research have heard that, but my mantra has become it's not really the randomized control trial that's the gold standard. It's the randomized control trial done effectively, um, where, we're not, where we are making sure those groups are the same before the intervention, and we're collecting data to show that their achievement, their socio-demographic characteristics, these kids are the same, and the only difference over time is that one had the program and one didn't, and we had some very sophisticated, sophisticated ways to design these studies. We're then tracking these students and making sure we all know students drop out of studies for whatever happens, that those who drop out are no different systematically than those who stay in, and that the, those that we have complete data on really do represent who we studied at the baseline before the intervention. So these are all of the thinking that goes into when you get to what up here we're talking about, these clearinghouses, we are then evaluating the rigor of the studies to see if it does make it that far up the evidence chain that it really is effective. And so if you go to our website, we've actually changed. We don't use the word evidence-based programs anymore. We use the word experimentally proven interventions and that and then we have information on this evidence continuum and when we talk about this it's really important to your point um, Jeff that we do have people with these ideas developing these interventions they do need to be involved from the beginning because they're the ones who came up they're the one who have the theory behind it they're the experts working in the classroom with the students but as you get farther up that evidence chain there does become a time where you have the people like the Beth Tiptons of the world developing these analyses coming in and then studying them and saying, yes, we do think if you're going to make it this far up the evidence chain, it does work. And if you don't, you then go back down the evidence chain and you collect more data. You figure out, how do I tweak my intervention? How do I test it out some more so that I can improve upon it? So all of these stages are really important, and you can't get to that last stage of experimentally proven until you've had all those other steps along the way. I, you know, I, I think all three of you are... Um making an implicit point that I, I think, you know, I've internalized and so maybe I don't make it often enough, but um, I think that, that people who do systematic reviewing and, and meta-analysis believe that, that the way progress is made is not through single studies, even if they're really well done, right? It's the it's accumulation of those studies and the explanation mm -hmm. that comes along with that accumulation that's really how we make progress. And one this is not a new idea. One can find quotes for 150, 200 years old of people saying essentially the same thing. This is not the first time this thing has ever been studied. We need to look at all of these studies of the effects of uh, citric acid on scurvy to see if maybe this might be an effective treatment. That reminds me of sort of, I think of it as a little bit of a paradox, that you can have one study that has a, a solid, positive, significant finding, and it, you can write your New York Times article about it, and it seems like it's, it's very definitive, but then as soon as you get a second study, and now um, you do a meta-analysis of those, it can become a no longer significant effect. And that seems strange. It seems like, well, wait a second, I have more sample, and now I know, it seems like I should know more, and actually I know less by doing more. And so it's a, a sort of a fundamental um, puzzle, I think, in this sort of synthesis world. Don't, don't you think, though, that, that um, part of the problem is that we use bad rules to decide on what works and what doesn't? Going back to something Larry said earlier, you know, if you, you take that, that one statistically significant finding, the first question ought to be, is this the first trial that's ever been done? 
Um, the, 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 I'm only half joking when I tell my graduate students that if they read about a study in the New York Times, they should feel free to disregard it because they are reading about it for the wrong reasons. And if they want to take it seriously, they should compute an effect size and cut it in half, mm -hmm. right? And then ask themselves, is this still a meaningful impact, right? Because the, the whole, the whole media-based method of learning about studies is seriously flawed. So that reminds me of, you know, a conversation we also had, which was about, you know, is synthesis the beginning or the end? And so we were all sort of in, in agreement, I think, that synthesis was sort of where you were headed. You were headed on multiple studies. But somebody on the call pointed out that at IES, the Institute for Education Sciences, there's a goal structure for um, how you sort of study different interventions. And in this goal structure, there's four goals that go in sequence to each other. And the, the largest of those is a goal for an effectiveness trial where you go out into a lot of schools and you don't have a developer involved. But in this um, goal structure, a research synthesis is actually the first goal. So it's actually the beginning, not the end. And so we had this interesting conversation about that tension um, in, it, you know, sort of what is the place of synthesis in the way that we do education research. I actually want to test IES out and submit a grant this summer. We'll see how I go with how well we do at this, but um, I, w I brought that up and um, the thinking and this really like as I speak with Larry about this, this is the future of clearinghouses because we have so many studies and when we think about meta-analysis for clearinghouses, it's actually a small sliver of what meta-analysis does. And so when I think about it in my role at Blueprints, I'm really drawing upon the Cochrane Collaboration's PICO model is how they describe it. And by that I mean you've got a research question that says I have a population and I am testing an intervention on that population and I'm conducting a comparison between individuals who receive it and individuals who don't, and I'm looking at the outcomes. And that when we think about meta-analysis in terms of external validity or being farther up, what I just described is that experimentally proven evidence chain, that there is such an important role for meta-analysis to play, and we need to be able to fund it, to look at if it only takes two or three studies to do a meta-analysis, how do we then combine the evidence to really think about not only whether this intervention is, you know, the statistical methods that go behind looking at or improving the robustness of your estimate by having more than one study. But as your body of evidence grows, it's so important then to look at those subgroups we care about. So does this intervention work for kids who struggle to learn? Does it work for low-income students, et cetera? And meta-analysis is such a powerful tool and we need to be thinking about this in terms of funding as well. Like, how do we not just stop our goal structure at goal four, where we look at eff effectiveness and we're looking at a particular intervention, it's been ramped up across a district, but multiple studies on that population that have maybe have been conducted in multiple states across different times, et cetera. So I was thinking about this quite a bit after our discussion, and I wanted to come up with an example of a funding organization who maybe um, has made some innovation in terms of where meta-analysis and research synthesis um, sort of belongs along that evidence chain. Um, and so I was thinking about um, some synthesis work I'm doing with colleagues at the American Institute um, of Research, AIR, funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, and so this was a very innovative sort of funding mechanism that they had where they funded us to essentially do what you might call a traditional meta-analysis. Um, and so first we were looking at, and so the topic was looking at juvenile drug courts and their effectiveness for adolescents with substance use problems who are involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and so OJJDP sort of um, came up with this concept and liked this idea of, well, start with your traditional meta-analysis, synthesize the existing evidence base that we have, um, and then we'll use that meta-analysis and that synthesis to then inform the development of guidelines that we can use to improve the practices that are happening in these juvenile drug courts across the country. And so we developed those guidelines then with a combination of synthesis as well as expert uh, opinion. And then now what we've done is um, implemented these guidelines across the country in juvenile drug courts um, and providing technical assistance training to those juvenile drug courts. But what was really innovative about this funding mechanism is that it built in funding then 
to do really high quality randomized control trials or high quality quasi experimental designs at 15 sites at juvenile drug courts across the nation to really see well, does the implementation of these new guidelines, is that actually improving effects in the way that we would hope? Um, and so then our intent is at the end of those 15 evaluation trials happening, is that we will then update our evidence synthesis and our meta analysis to see how has that accumulation of that evidence now informed or changed changed our perspective on what's best practice in those drug courts. So I think that that's a, a good that's example a really of how we can think about meta-analysis and evidence synthesis all along this evidence chain or what I would call an evidence cycle, right, because the world changes. And so what's effective in 2018 may not be effective in 2028. Um, and so really thinking about synthesis playing a role all along that cycle. That's a really great point. And I was going to say that that highlights how a synthesis is not, in saying that it's a cycle and that it's not the end, but kind of the beginning, what are your thoughts on sort of what you have found in the WWC or in blueprints and about what that says to the kinds of studies that need to be done? And is there a clear pathway for, from what has been done to making clear to researchers, hey, we have a big gap right here? Well, I, uh, for me, um I think the clearinghouse badly needs longer term, larger studies of impacts of interventions on valued outcomes. And so and moving towards that, as I mentioned earlier, I think is going to be very hard to do uh, because of the, the various um, incentives that the, the research providers have. But perhaps funders can help. And, and it's hard to show that kind of change, too. I mean, it, it, this is tough work. Um, and so, you know, what is considered sustained effects, too? But that is important in, in replication. And, um, and to, to, you know, it is, at least from blueprints, we're thinking about not just that single study approach, but how do you then define that preponderance of evidence and how can meta-analysis be a tool to help you do that? And I would say that at the What Works Clearinghouse, um, the practice guides um, that come out of the clearinghouse, I think part of the intent there is to do sort of systematic uh, research synthesis, but also bringing in the practitioner and teacher perspective. Um, and I think those practice guides, I'm not sure if it's effective or not, but I think the intent of those practice guides is really to identify those gaps then that could be key priorities for funding. Moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to sort of talk for a little bit about something you guys mentioned, too, about harmonizing across clearinghouses. So I'm particularly interested in this. I mentioned that we are in talks with the Gates Foundation to have a meeting of clearinghouses. Um, but I want to, if this came up in our conversation that um, what Blueprints does is different than what WWC does, which might be different than what another clearinghouse does, and how these different guidelines might impact the way people perceive evidence in clearinghouses that if something would count as evidence in one clearinghouse and not in another, what does that mean for sort of the role of translation? And that's, I, I think you might have said that. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a good answer to that, but it's, it's problematic. And part of it is um, we all have different ways of describing what the standards are and um, determining how high that bar is. So what works clearinghouse has a high bar. The joke is it's actually called what doesn't work in mm -hmm. education, and Blueprints has a high bar as well. Um, there are different registries. They claim to have, they would say that their standards are high, but they're funded by different mechanisms, and they have different mandates that go with their funding as well. We are privately funded, and our mandate is to find impact that's sustained over time and replicated and can have a large-scale effect. Um, and so... Um, it is confusing to the consumer. There is something called the Results First Clearinghouse that the Pew Charitable, Pew Charitable Fust, Trust has funded. Sorry. Um, and they tried to, or they did map out the different standards across, I think there's six or seven different clearinghouses on that. And it is confusing to the consumer. What happens if um, it, this program is effective in this clearinghouse but not in that clearinghouse? And part of it is educating the importance of having high standards. That's why I like to use that FDA analogy, because I think that speaks to all of us. We don't want to eat food that, that has low standards in terms of determining if it is safe to consume. And so the same can be said about these clearinghouses. Um, and you know, part of it is having more and more of these conversations to try and get on the same page. Um, 
And I think that's part of the problem. But I think another big part of the problem is just getting consumers to come to our websites and even know that we exist in the first place. I and mean, we tend to have, I get a lot of questions from evaluators. What does it take to, to meet Blueprint standards? Um, and I also get questions from developers. If we're designing a study that we want to evaluate on our intervention, how do we meet your standards? I don't get a lot of questions from the general community saying, you know, help me navigate your website. And that's on us to figure out. That's on us to figure out how to market. That's on us to figure out how to have products that are accessible to the community. It's also getting the word out and getting folks to not just go off what they think works or what they, it's to take your own professional expertise, but know where to go to have a trusted source. Of, of evidence to get information from. So um, there's a lot, of, we've come a long way, and there's mm -hmm. still a lot more work to do. And we're excited about projects like what you're taking on because I think you're gonna support our efforts in terms of, we wanna get this information out to the community. Um, we also wanna improve what we're doing in terms of the, how, we're um, how we're disseminating that information. Not a good answer. No, no. Other than, it... other than you know, it's frustrating, and um, we we have to keep working on it. And, and just to jump onto that translation sort of conversation, do you, what is WWC doing, or how do, how do you think those conversations are going there? Well, again, if we if we look at the director of IES, right, this is one of his key priorities in the coming years is really making the WellWorks clearinghouse and the products that are coming out of that more accessible. Um, to the people that we're trying to get it to, right? The teachers and the principals, the school administrators, the parents. Um, and so I think that this is the tough challenge. This is one of our big challenges. And this, you know, goes along with your step center and thinking about translation and dissemination. And it's ensuring that we have the right people in the room when we have these conversations. Because again, too often, it's statisticians and methodologists and researchers coming up um, with our ideas. And we don't have uh, those key stakeholders in the room as equal participants in those conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could give a quick pitch, one of the things we do at Blueprints that I um, really think is a good idea is we, we say it's not enough to look at the evaluation quality of an individual study. We say it's important to look at how is it being implemented in community, and that's actually something we factor into our certification standards. But every other year we have a conference, and it's a learning community. And we invite practitioners, we invite policymakers, we invite funders, we invite evaluators to come to the room and we have sessions that we talk about what does it take to implement these programs what are some of the challenges how do we get the information how do we not preach to the choir in terms of using us as a trusted source um, how do we have an impact statewide how do we you know in terms of getting policymakers to pay attention to what we're doing and what we're promoting etc so that is something unique that we do do we'll have it April 2000, 2020 in Boulder Colorado right. Very nice. You know, one of it's. I, I think that that's both of you have made important points, and and there's a related, there's a component to the question that we haven't really mm -hmm. addressed so far is the the uh, consumer-based conundrum that happens when different clearinghouses look at the same evidence and and perhaps reach different conclusions, and for the most part, the clearinghouses are operating in different spaces, right? There, so education versus labor versus something else, um, and. One of the things that I'm convinced about that represents a really serious challenge is that uh, what constitutes research quality varies as a function of the research question. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, there, there prob it probably isn't, there, there will be almost no aspects, despite what you've read in textbooks, right? There will be no aspects of, a, of, of research design that will routinely lead to bias. Right, it just depends on sort of how things are implemented or, or, or the context in which something is implemented. So for example, attrition among, uh, in a study of elementary school children in the, in the United States where uh, elementary schooling is mandatory and attendance rates tend to be high is probably not nearly as big of a problem as it is in a drug cessation study. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know who's leaving that, those trials. It's people who don't want to quit. Um, so um, I, I really think that that study quality issue is a, is a is almost baked into the setup of these clearinghouses because they have different, uh, they operate in different contexts, and it's not going to be surprising when they try to overlap that they reach different conclusions. That's a really good point. I want to open this up to questions um, from the audience. Oh, Barbara Schneider. Yes, Barbara. 
one thing that you didn't talk about that I thought for sure you would have on the harmonization one is the registries. Because I think that if you thought about the registries, that might be a place to start with the standards. Hmm. Because if the standards were similar across the registries, then perhaps it might be a lot easier to get harmonization. So I'd like if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about the registries. Beth, this is something I know you know well, and Larry, it's something that you have supported. So just maybe I should say to make it clear for the audience, there's been um, increased effort in all of the sciences to pre-register your studies and to pre-register them in a public place. Um, so it's sort of a commitment mechanism that you can say what your hypotheses are in advance and what the analysis that you'll do is. Um, and um, there's a new registry, the registry on educational, it's RIS. Efficacy what? and effectiveness studies. No, the studies, thank you. Um, and, and so there's been a great effort in the education community to sort of bring about this registry as a way for people to register and commit to these hypotheses. So that's a great point, Barbara, that the way that you, the sort of defaults you put into that registry will guide the future. Have you guys thought about this at all yourselves? I, I think it'll make studying the effects of research decisions easier, for sure, and that will be a big help. Um, at Blueprints, we've actually tried, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we um, tested, or dipped our toe in the water of looking at how pre-registration could factor into the decision around certification. And the way our process works is we have this internal review process where we have staff with methodological expertise who are vetting the studies. And when we believe it gets to a level of we think this shows promise in terms of the scientific rigor, we hand it over to our external our, um, advisory board, one of which is Larry Hedges, and then they examine the study to determine if it meets the scientific rigor. And if it meets both levels, then it gets certified at a certain level. And one of the things we're starting to do is for studies that make it through our internal process, examining to see if any of those studies have been pre-registered. And I can't remember how many we've, because again, we don't, we work beyond just education. We work in multiple fields. I want to say there are seven, eight, nine. I can't remember how many registries we've looked at. Um, and at least being able to provide that information to our board of directors in terms of, did they pre-register? If they did, what were those pre-registered research questions? Um, and then they can look at the study itself and see if that's what was reported upon. Um, what were the samples, et cetera? What were the instruments? So um, we, this is something we've just been exploring this past year, and it's something that I do think is important to consider. Um, and we also want to encourage researchers to do this work, to, to pre-register and make it an incentive and not any, any kind of punitive, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, and the whole idea is if you pre-register your study and things change over time, you're just, you're reporting that along the way. And so that way, those of us who then look at your evidence, we can understand all the decisions that went into that study and then see what was reported upon. And I think this is, I'm so glad you brought this up because this is one of the more exciting things happening in the field of education now. And, you know, talks of having that pre-registration go into these standards of excellence, right, in terms of whether that study gets that gold star um, of meeting these criteria. And so I think if we can incentivize that for researchers, again, so that it's not perceived as punitive, um, that that really can take us uh, quite a long way. So I'm excited about that possibility. One of the ideas, this is not my idea, so I don't want to claim that it's a, I think it's a great idea. One of the ideas I've heard floated is so, for example, if you meet What Works Clearinghouse with, what is it, without reservations, and you have a positive effect, then you get maybe an extra gold medal with that mm -hmm. certification because you actually pre-registered that entire study, and that's what you found the positive effect on. So that's what I mean by how do we think about this as an incentive as opposed to, wow, you didn't pre-register, that's not what you're reporting, you know, and, and, and we do. We want, we want to make sure that the evidence is... Um, something theoretical you, you thought of in advance and that we're not doing any kind of cherry picking, but we also want to encourage the field to just be transparent. That also helps with replication, which is right in along the lines of what we're here to talk about today. Um, I myself, unrelated to Blueprints, have been doing a study where I have individual student level data that's really hard to access, and I, for, because of my 
MOUs. I can't, I, I joke that I have to like give away my firstborn child in order to get access to these data. And, um, but what we've done is we pre-registered the study and put the code in our, every single step we've made, every single decision we've made, we've pre-registered that. The idea being if someone else gets access to these data, you can replicate. So I'm really glad you brought that point up because it is, when we think about the future, I don't know how you can think about meta-analysis without thinking about pre-registration and what mechanisms do we need to put in place in order to support the possibility of replication even occurring. That's a great point. And I think that there are local ways that we can incentivize researchers as well. So I know within our College of Education, for instance, we publicly um, were uh, encouraging our scientists and our researchers to be registering on that uh, new RIS registry and then giving them sort of public acknowledgement um, in our faculty and staff meetings and sending out congratulations. And so again, there are those sort of slight signaling but very symbolic ways that we can incentivize that type of behavior locally. Great. Are there other questions? Uh, yes, David. So I'm David Figlio. I'm the Dean of the School of Education and Social Policy here at Northwestern. But I'd like to ask a question in a di very different role, which is I'm the editor in chief of the Journal of Human Resources, which in economics is currently the number two impact factor journal in the entire field of economics. Um, as such, I have some power um, in that role. How, what would you like to say to journal editors in the, I would say kind of the mainstream journals that typically eschew all of the things you're talking about <laughs> over the last 55 minutes uh, that maybe we could help to implement to make, um, uh, re that, to make the, the dissemination of research evidence more effective? Well, so I think that, I'm, I'm gonna jump in, but I, I think that there are standards that have been put together in other places like, um, that might be applicable. So thinking about reporting, I think anybody who does a meta-analysis afterwards, they, they say, well, if only people would report the information that I need, then I could better meta-analyze it. And so I think putting that sort of hat on of if we were going to accumulate evidence across studies in your journal, what would that include? Um, and that you, you can think through that has to do with the sort of identification strategies um, in your sort of in the econ language, which I'm sure people are more likely to report the internal validity parts. But I would add context and external validity parts are underreported a lot. But perhaps you guys have other things that you think might need to be reported. I mean, having reporting guidelines at, at all is, I think, a step forward. Mm -hmm. So when I talked about the randomized control trial being not really the gold standard, it's the randomized control trial done well, one of the things that I think IES and What Works Clearinghouse and um, JRE have done well is there is communication around what the standards are for your um, clearinghouse. I think that we need those, we need to make sure that journal editors are adopting these standards or are familiar with these standards because not all the studies that we evaluate are peer reviewed, but quite a few are. And a lot of times they're not getting certified because they're missing so much information. And, and this is hard because different fields are dictated by different standards. So it, there is no easy answer to it. Um, but to your point, a lot of this, a lot of these studies it's not that they aren't done well, it's that we just, they're inconclusive because of the lack of information in there. And if we could have that be part of the peer review process, in a sense, you're doing our work for us then. Um, and so that we're getting studies that are hitting on these standards. I was part of a, a meeting at NIH that was about the reporting guidelines for clinical trials. And a discussion there was sort of trying to come up with subgroups that were important for clinical trials to report across studies. And so uh, we were thinking of it as sort of supplementary information. So you wouldn't want in any one study to say, we need you to report all of these different subgroups because you worry that you're gonna have find, there's spurious findings, that you're gonna, you're just kind of p-hacking your way through trying to find something significant. But on the other hand, in the accumulation of evidence side, you need those subgroup findings. And so the discussion there was coming together and thinking about what were those agreed upon subgroups and sort of where would you report that? That maybe it wouldn't go in the main journal article, but maybe it would be an online supplement and there would be, you could imagine there being sort of a format to this of the information that you would pr provide. 
David, I would make a plea for structured abstracts, uh, for uh, considering a model in which the introduction and method section is evaluated separately from the results, uh, and consider a model in which uh, prospectively registered studies, like people could prospectively submit an intro and methods to JHR, get approval on that, and then as long as they follow their plan uh, and you know, to, to a reasonable degree, that you will accept their paper regardless of how it turns out. And that's exactly what I was going to say, I think, for JHR as a journal editor, right? And so you don't even have to take up the printed journal space for those pre-registrations. But even if that's sort of on the online version, I think that's a great incentive uh, for getting high, the highest quality research in, in that journal. And one more thing to add is these journals oftentimes um, reward or publish innovative and new ideas. We need to publish replication as well. It's okay to you know publish ideas that are not yours because you're replicating it, and that then lends itself to being able to do systematic reviews, etc. So then it's the contingency on getting published is about the design of your study yes. and the need for your study, not about the findings mm -hmm. and, and what you find. Right.